The information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon. Guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned. Before making any investment, insurance or financial planning decisions, you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you. Hello and welcome to your Monday night property edition of Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas. New South Wales first home buyers could be allowed to pay off their stamp duty over several years in a hex-like scheme to reinvigorate the property market. The pay-as-you-go plan is one of several proposed by the Real Estate Institute of New South Wales and being considered by the state government. Purchasers would be able to pay off their tax burden over three years, but the government would be protected with stamp duty guaranteed against the property in the same way as unpaid land tax. The Real Estate Institute of New South Wales also called on the government to slash red tape and apply stamp duty concessions on homes purchased by residents over 65 to make it easier for the elderly to downsize their homes. And in more news about getting property markets moving, Queensland Premier Campbell Newman has begun implementing his promise to slash the cost of living and cut through real estate red tape in a bid to drag the property market out of the doldrums. Cabinet formally approved the reinstatement of the principal place of residence stamp duty concessions from 1 July and commuters using a go card will travel free on public transport after making nine journeys in a week from July 1. Now here with me tonight to discuss these news stories and of course answer any questions that you might have about property investing is Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors and Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. And so if you have any question about investing in Melbourne, what's happening in the rest of the country or general investing questions, get them ready and call now to join the queue simply by phoning 1300 30 34 35 or if you'd rather write it down, you can email it to us at property at skynews.com.au. And welcome to the program. And welcome to you both. Thank you. Welcome, now, before we get to those stories, I'd like to just have a really quick snapshot of what the property markets are looking like at the moment. Um, Andrew, I know that AAPM has recently released some, some brand new figures for us. Um, you know, what's hot and what's not at the moment? Well, I think uh, markets are generally turning out as we expected so far this year, Margaret. Um, we're seeing increased buyer activity in, uh, in a number of markets. Uh, Sydney solid, uh, Brisbane and Perth are looking quite interesting and, uh, and Melbourne has surprised really with its, uh, with its resilience this year so far. Okay, so you're saying, I know a lot of the reports are saying that you know, Melbourne had such a really good year in probably those two years post GFC, mm -hmm. contrary to what we should have expected, almost like nobody told them that there was a GFC going on. Mm -hmm. And then we suddenly saw a real flattening, but they haven't lost anything out of the market. Is that, but is that what you're saying? They're, you know, it's flattened a little bit, but but it's still remaining fairly strong. Well, well, Melbourne experienced the strongest price growth through that 2009-2010 period. Median house prices up by about 30% over that period, and that's clearly not sustainable. Mm. So we expected it to come back to the mark a little bit uh, and to continue adjusting. But uh, it's shown some resilience so far this year. I'm not quite sure that it will continue. Uh, I think we're seeing a bit of uh, bargain buying in the prestige market area. Mm. Now, it might turn out to be a bit of a dead cat bounce. But uh, yeah. we'll wait and see. And there are, look, there are, there are headwinds down in Victoria in terms of the local economy. Uh, unemployment rates there in Victoria 5.8%, which is 1% higher than New South Wales. Mm. And the trend is definitely deteriorating in terms of employment in the local economy. Mm, interesting, Ben. Of course, you're from Melbourne. And I guess, um, you know, for while we saw all of the really good stuff happening in Melbourne in that, those two years, you know, New South Wales was just really flagging behind and we had all the bad news in the world coming out of New South Wales, including a government that was in disarray. And it really does seem now like we've kind of bounced back off that and, and New South Wales is coming out more of the star performer. Yeah, look, I, I think New South Wales is about to move ahead quicker than the Victorian and the Melbourne markets. So if we recap back what drove the Melbourne market with this you know, influx of population growth coming into the market, 
Um, we saw interest rates at historical low levels. Um, we saw supply levels at record lows. And so we had this magnificent run. What we're seeing there now is um, we still see it. there's quite a lot of supply coming onto the market as well. So I think from that point of view, I'm, I'm more of, of a balanced market in Melbourne. I don't see us you know, having more serious problems unless our economy starts to continue to falter. And then I think some of the outer suburbs may see a little bit of correction. There's still a lot of popularity for the lifestyle areas and I think they'll still hold up. Mm. Um, Andrew, what about flood affected zones in Queensland? Um, have, has everybody forgotten about the floods already? And are I think seeing they're starting to, Margaret, it's yes. I think, than I yes. thought it would. There's been a lot of commentators. <laughs> but uh, no, 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 Look, Queensland's uh, generally uh, lifting in confidence. I think the, uh, the new government helps that long-term government change. I think people will uh, offer that government quite a significant honeymoon period. And it just tends to lift buyer confidence. And I think we're seeing that uh, coming through. Of course, Brisbane was, uh, was oversold last year due to the floods and a number of other issues. Uh, and it, at one stage, it was... Uh, the most affordable of all the capital city markets mm. on the mainland. So uh, there's definitely a lot of upside from that perspective and, and I think we're starting to see that come mm. through now. I guess one of the other dangers though in the Brisbane market at the moment from what I can see is that two things were happening. First of all a GFC which meant that a lot of those projects on those inner city apartments fell over for a little while as developers couldn't get the funds for them. And then we had the floods come through which actually flooded a lot of those same developments and they, they kind of stopped and now we're seeing a lot of them come back on together and I'm seeing that in the next couple of years we're probably going to see a real um, flood, excuse the pun, onto the market of these unit developments all along the river there which will temporarily keep the prices way down um, and, and I think affect unit prices in, in Brisbane overall. I agree with you, Margaret, but I think uh, Brisbane is right for high-density developments and living, and I think that's uh, certainly the medium-term future for the city. Uh, it, it doesn't have the same level of maturity as Melbourne and Sydney do with that higher inner-city, higher-density living. So, um, and it comes suddenly, doesn't it? Well, it it's, does. It, and I think, you know, over the long term, we'll see the same thing happen in places like Perth and Adelaide, a long way off yet for both Absolutely. of them. You wouldn't really buy a unit in either Perth or Adelaide, but both of those markets are markets that you can see where they sit in the cycle as compared to Sydney and Melbourne and you can see that give them another 10 years and you'll start getting the unit development and as you say that maturity into city living which neither of them have at the moment. Yeah, no, I think, I think it's, a, it's a good medium term bet uh, in a city living in Brisbane and, uh, and that's because the, the potential there for development is, uh, is very strong. Mm. Ben, um, one of the things about the Queensland market, I guess, at the moment as well, is that we really are seeing almost like two separate markets happening there. We've got some very strong regionals, particularly those that are either, of course, mining uh, towns, yes. but there are some really good towns that kind of sit with a mining influence that aren't reliant on the mining industry, very diversified industries within town. Yep. But benefit from mining activity, like Toowoomba right at the bottom of the Surat Basin there. Correct. So lots of really good stuff happening in Toowoomba, very affordable prices, much more interest coming into that market, but they don't rely on the mining. And yet we've got some of the regionals like at Mackay and to a lesser degree places like some of the Whit Sundays, where they really are struggling badly. Look, areas like Early Beach and so forth, that, you know, they were tourism-led booms. Um, people looking for that lifestyle choice, but there's just no fundamental um, outcomes in terms of income. There wasn't the income in those local areas, and that's what we saw in, in those particular markets. And it's coming back to that point, Margaret, isn't it? Is about there's the lifestyle test for some of those mining towns. So you can really make a, a speculative play on the real mining towns, the one industry towns, and, and if you get it right, you're in for a nice run, but by all means, as soon as the mine shuts, forget it, close up the shop, you know, it's going to be a ghost town. Mm. Whereas the towns that are in driving distance, which have that lifestyle element to it, and people are willing to do their sort of seven days on, seven days off, or their fortnight on, and get that five day break and get back to the lifestyle test where they can get out there and put their tinnies in, grab a fresh, you know, fish, whatever it may be, that's the lifestyle check. And that's what people are looking for. Mm. You know, if you take the jobs away, will they still stay there? That's mm. the big question. There's a few of those. We'll get back to that. And I also want to talk about Mount Isa because that's a little bit of a, almost a far 
wild experiment and we'll talk about why in a little while but for now let's go to the email and Dal has a question this week about who to get help from and he asks I'd like to start investing and I've been contacted by a company that will do it all for me and being a complete novice and also time poor this appeals to me. The company claims to have a team of researchers, accountants, financial strategists, mortgage brokers. Can you shed some light on these types of companies and give any pros and cons to using them as I'm skeptical? It all seems to be too good to be true. I also have a very good accountant who has recently added this type of service to his offices, albeit on a smaller scale. I do feel a sense of trust with my accountant believe he would not associate with anyone less than reputable. Andrew, what do you think? There's an awful lot of companies out there at the moment and it's hard to cut through to the good guys. Well, it is and, um, you know, all decisions uh, benefit from information and knowledge and it's a question, I guess, of shopping around and, like any other product, looking for recommendations or, or how people are situated in the marketplace in terms of those services that are, that are offered. But, mm. um, you know, I guess it's just buyer beware in a lot of circumstances. Mm. Ben, what do you think? Same as Andrew, buy beware. I mean, the first thing I'd look for, Dale, is are they a member of PIPA, Property Investment Professionals of Australia? P PIPA members basically operate under a code of conduct, which the, the most important thing in, in terms of when I read this email was, what sort of disclosure are you getting? What are they paying each other? Do they have your vested interests in mind over those of their own? You know, so that's the, that's the big question. So I, I will say to you, Dale, get something in writing from them. Tell them to put down in writing exactly how they're getting paid because if they start to act a little bit strange around that type of question, then you know you may not be dealing with someone who has your vested interests at heart. Mm, look, it's great advice and I've been getting more than my fair share of emails about this very topic lately, which is why I wanted to include Dale's email this week. I'm finding that there are another big swathe of companies who have suddenly come back into the marketplace. They tend to go out find a developer who may be having difficulty selling their properties or who want to get onto the stage and sell to a wider audience. They negotiate a pretty darn good deal with that developer for forty, fifty thousand dollars worth of commission, sometimes a bit less, but you can always guarantee that it's a fairly large amount of commission. And then when you take delivery of the property, it's going to be over market value. I've seen these house and land packages come to uh, property investors who are fairly innocent and and then they find that a year later it's worth 20000 less or even in the same week that they buy that brand spanking new house and land package around the corner is almost the same property 12 months old that is actually $40,000 cheaper. You've got to just be really careful of them and as Ben says if they're a member of PIPA at least you know they have to disclose to you where they're making their money. Find out how many people are in the chain. With all of the people that you're talking about in that chain there's a lot of people to get paid. So where are they getting paid? If you're not paying anything for that service, if it's not a user pay service, then they're getting their money out of commissions. They'll tell you that they're just sharing in developer profit, but I can tell you if that's the case, just go straight to the developer yourself and ask if you can have a discount to the purchase price by sharing in the developer profit as well. There are some good ones out there. I'm not saying they're all the same, but I've seen the websites of some pretty shocking companies and they sound great and you'll be excited when you hear about them and it sounds like they do everything for you. But as Andrew says, let the buyer beware. Be very, very careful before you get into bed with a company that makes their money purely out of sales commissions. And from WA, you've got a question about Central Adelaide. Hi, yes, Anne. Thank you, Margaret. Um, we've just recently purchased an apartment in Central Adelaide. Okay. It's, um, I would class it as a five star. It's uh, three bedrooms, three uh, en suites. It's uh, a lovely apartment. We um, are looking at using it on short term rental basis. That's what we've been encouraged to do, and we have furnished it accordingly. But I'm wondering whether the panel has any views on one thing or another, short term or long term. And is this part of an overall uh, managed apartment? So is it leased no, out? No, it's no, not? It's quite separate. We've, we've bought it independently yes. and we've gone out and selected an agent 
okay. to work for us. Okay, well that's good. I, I'm, I'm pleased about that because I know there are so many of these, you know, managed departments where the overlying management tends to eat into the return with gro huge costs. Ben, what do you think about Central Adelaide for an apartment of that description at the moment? Well, Anne's already jumped into that market with her three bed, three ensuite property. And the, the, the managing agents on the ground are going to give you a good indication of how you should be positioning your property in terms of whether it's short term accommodation, i.e. the executives who are coming in, Adelaide is prime for a mining boom that's going to roll through that, uh, that market over the next five or so years. So I expect central Adelaide accommodation is going to be at a premium for those people who are going to base themselves out of there. The, the research is around you know, what your property agent is telling you around the demand drivers. If there is demand for this type of accommodation, then you've done the right thing. You put the property in there, you've got the, a strong depreciation on your, on your furniture that you're putting in there. So I would be staying close with, with your property manager to ensure that it's the right thing. It's very hard for someone to comment outside of that market to give you further advice. So just stay close to your property manager. Mm. Uh, Andrew, what are the stats telling us about Central Adelaide? Well, certainly um, Adelaide was a bit of a bear for me for this year. I thought that it might struggle a little bit to, um, to produce any real growth. Um, and there were some economic issues that were driving that. But I think Adelaide's just making up its mind now about which direction it's going to go. And uh, it actually could surprise. Um, it's surprising me early signs that it, uh, it just might provide some growth this year. So um, probably a reasonable investment, even in the short term. Mm. Well, Anne, it's certainly no surprise to me. I've been talking about Adelaide for a couple of years now. Now, even when the doomsayers have been saying that, it's, that they're bearish on it. Um, I've liked Adelaide for a lot of reasons and that's because I felt that while we've been talking about Adelaide for the last couple of years, we've been talking about a market that's pre boom and I'm not expecting any major boom like we saw in Perth with a, an almost tripling of values in some areas but I certainly do think that Adelaide is ready to take that next big step up and I think there are many areas that, got, that are going to be impacted by that. Adelaide geographically doesn't have very broad borders and therefore you're not going to see a big difference in the growth across all of Adelaide as you do in Melbourne and Sydney and all of the councils in Adelaide and in South Australia, in fact, are very committed to not changing their ratio of rural land to residential land. At the moment, it sits somewhere around the 25% residential, 75% rural, and most councils are really committed to keeping it that way. And as such, the new town plans in a lot of the outlying councils are including a lot of infill development, smaller block sizes, and an allowance for subdivision that wasn't previously there. What you're going to see that do is contain all the population within those borders and I think the demand for, for property all throughout Adelaide is really going to experience a boost from that. I think it's a great buy for you. Anywhere in Adelaide is good. Um, as Ben says, get your depreciation reports done. Get, take advantage of a really good cash flow for now and make sure that you pay as much money as you can into that loan, cycle your cash flow back into debt repayment so that you are also, as well as natural market growth, you're getting equity in your mortgage by paying down that loan and growing the equity or the part of that portfolio that you actually own. Well, this week we're continuing with our question of the week, and this is your chance to get hold of a copy of one of my books. Now, each week, the panel and I will choose one question from either the emails or the calls, and we'll send a copy of my book. This week, the best email we'll receive, How to Create an Income for Life. It's a great all-round book, which gives you a solid education about how to invest in property. Now, all you have to do is call or email, and make sure that you watch at the end of the show to see if you're the lucky person. We're now off for a very short break. Stay with us. After the break, the panel and I will be taking more calls and, of course, answering some more email. Welcome back. It's Monday night, property night. I'm Margaret Lomas and this evening I have with me in the studio Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors and Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. And we think that we can help you with your property investing questions. Now it's easy to ask us a question. All you need is a phone, a computer, an iPad or even an iPhone. And of course the number which is 1330 3435 or the email address which is property at skynews.com. .au. And Ken from Copperbella, you've got a question about cows in Victoria down near Phillip Island. Oh, that's correct. I've got a two-storey unit down there 
And I was just wondering what you think the prospect is for cows now that they've nearly duplicated the highway up there. Yes, well that highway has been a great old um, infrastructure, a piece of infrastructure development, Ben. Although it still is a little bit of a car park if you happen to be on it at the wrong time. Yeah, especially if you're down there with one of the motor events that it goes on down towards Phillip Island Way. Yes. Ken, um, Cowes is, is one of those um, interesting places. There's obviously been a lot of development and a lot of building going on down Cowes, Phillip Island Way. Um, you are timing the market from a uh, sea change slash green change type environment. So we're going to see a lot of people um, looking to take choices of those holiday homes and moving down to that area. The one concern I may have about cows is the same concern I have about most resort areas, and that is that there is some seasonality associated with that and there might be some supply, or oh, sorry, demand drop off. So you might see a bit of oversupply in those type of markets. Um, you know, you've obviously done a bit of research, you've, you've got yourself a two-storey unit in that area um, and I suspect that you know, over the short to medium term it might be a little bit flat, um, hopefully the longer term it will improve as we see more retirees driving demand in those areas. Mm. Now of course Andrew, you know, all down around that area is very beautiful and people still do go down there from Melbourne for their holidays, mm -hmm. you'd know it quite well because you're a film, former Melbourne person. Yes I am. Um, but I'm not sure whether it, there's, there's a lot of short term options there, I think it's probably going to be a lot further out yet. Well, well South East Gippsland is a, a very popular spot, it's also a growth spot in Volok, these type of areas even moving all the way down to, um, to Foster. Uh, Sandy Point, these areas are very popular vacation spots. Of course, the vacation market is always hit uh, when we have a, uh, a bit of a soft patch in the prestige market. We lose those prosperity buyers, those sea change buyers who are looking for an additional house and uh, we still have that quietness in the prestige market. So that would, I guess, in the shorter term, keep the market a little mm, flat. Yeah. Look, I agree, Ken. I think over the long term, and it depends on how long you've got to hold this property, often we see a, a relatively good long-term result in those kinds of sea change locations but you do need to wait around for quite a long time. What tends to happen is after the areas of Melbourne that are con considered to be very suburban and family oriented areas and at the moment they're still representing a nice affordable buy for families in Victoria, once that happens, um, once those properties begin to grow up in value and start to get out out of the reach of the people who are buying them or the people who will buy them, we then see areas like cows and those kinds of vacation areas suddenly change hands and become the areas that families move to. It usually starts with a good piece of infrastructure like a, a duplication of a highway down there. If I can use as an example the central coast of New South Wales, what we saw happen there is once the outer suburbs of Sydney started to get a little bit more unaffordable, then people went looking elsewhere and because there was a great freeway up into the central coast, that's where they all went. Now it provided a boost for a, quite a few years on the central coast. It's flattened for a long time then, but that boost did come. And I think that's going to happen to you, Ken. Um, I think with cows, it's probably a little way out yet, and I'm pitching it at around about 10 years. In the meantime, I don't think it'll lose value, but I think you're not going to see any really big growth in that area for, for some time yet. Well, what should you do with an underperforming property? Adam writes, Hi Margaret and panel, I have an investment property in an area which seems to be underperforming which I have of late considered selling due to poor performance in terms of capital growth. As there are no issues in maintaining the mortgage, I don't want to sell it unless I absolutely have to, especially with the market in its current state. However, at the same time, there are so many other areas that I'd like to get into and I don't want to hold on to an underperforming asset at the opportunity cost of purchasing elsewhere. Should I hang on or move on? Sounds like um, Dr. Phil, doesn't it? <laughs> Should I hang on to my boyfriend or move on from him? Well, it depends on the boyfriend, doesn't it? <laughs> the options. Exactly. Uh, and I think it's a little difficult to make an assessment without knowing exactly where the, the uh, existing property and the prospective properties are located. Oh, well, I can actually tell you where the existing oh, okay. property is. Oh, okay. um, and I, I guess I kind of kept the name out because you know, I, I don't like the show to become about where should I buy, okay. about area specific. Um, in this case, I will tell you it was Albury, Albury Wodonga. Okay. Um, and the reason that I'm saying that now is because I'd like some general advice too about what do you do when you've got a property that is underperforming? Just how do you deal with that? 
Well, certainly decision making has to take account of the transaction costs that are involved and they can be quite considerable. So I guess it's a balancing act. Um, and, and sometimes it's difficult to move on if you've had a property for a period of time and you're looking for uh, you know, a longer term aspect. So without, as I said, we need to look at, the, I guess, the prospects of, uh, of optional investments um, that, that, that are out there. But um, certainly Albury is, uh, I guess, a slight underperformer. That, that area hasn't, I guess, moved on as quickly as we thought it would in terms of government planning for the dual cities there on the border. Um, so a difficult question, I guess. And I, I, it depends on those transaction costs and, uh, you know, the optional investments that are available. Mm. And, Ben, personal circumstances really go a long way toward helping make the decision. We don't know anything about AMS cash flow, so I would always say it's always in the numbers. But looking at it in isolation, it's as simple as this. Your exit costs, i.e., your selling cost of getting out of it. Now, you should also include the cost of establishing that property. So you're talking around a 10 to 12 per cent cost of getting out, and then you've got entry costs of getting into the new investment. So once you marry those up, so you're going to have to do some research around what it is that, that you think the new area is going to perform, the famous opportunity cost question. If you think the new area is going to do better that over the longer term, then turning that property over may be a good idea. But again, it's all going to come down to the numbers. So I would look at the exit costs, the entry costs into the new property, and then look at what, what ex expected performance I'm going to get over the short and long term from a cash flow point of view with the new purchase. Mm. And I'd take that one step further, Anna, and what I would do is I'd take those 20 questions, which is all about the research, and I'd ask them about Albury. Because the last thing you want to do is get out of an area that suddenly goes up in value. So start with your personal circumstances. Is hanging on to that property holding you back from getting into something else? If it is holding you back because the bank won't lend any more money to you, assess the current area ask those questions. What infrastructure is coming up? Is the population growing faster than the national average? Is the median household income growing faster than the national average? They're the kinds of questions that help you determine whether there's suitable demand coming up in the future. It's not about what's happening today, it's about what's happening tomorrow because it's tomorrow when you'll notice the loss of a property that suddenly went well after you got out of the market. If you can't get satisfactory answers to those questions and it looks like it's not going to perform in the coming five to ten years, then it's probably an easy out for you. Yes, you should get out if it's holding you back so that you can get into an area that does answer the 20 questions. If it isn't holding you back and it's sitting in your portfolio and at least it's getting a rent return and you can still go on and do other investing, then you might want to hang on and just see what happens because that way you can still buy something else while you wait and see whether or not Aubrey actually does end up growing well or not. I'd also get some good independent advice too. Ian from Mildura, you want to know about renting part of a house. Yes, glad Margaret, thanks for taking the call. You're welcome. Um, yes, if we were to purchase a, a property and then live in it and rent part of it out, mm -hmm. what percentage or, um, would, would, would we be able to claim, or would we declare all, all the income uh, the rent as income, what percentage then would we be able to claim as a, on a tax? Okay, so there's a couple of issues here, Ben, um, for Ian to think about. Ian, I'm not a tax accountant or a tax agent, so I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of talk in a general sense. Um, the consideration that you're talking about is what portion of the house will you be able to claim or cost of running the house will you be able to claim to offset against the rental income that you're going to get. The secondary part of that is the consideration about the impact on your capital gain. And I'm going to hand over to Margaret. Margaret, she's going to obviously give you a little bit more detail, but, but that's the type of question you want. So you want to go and get your advice from your tax agent and you want to tell him exactly the type of property that may be. It's going to be considerations on bedroom use. It's going to be considerations on access to living areas. And that's what's going to determine the percentage. Mm. Ian um, and, and Ben is right. They're the things that you need to consider about consider the way it works is this you declare all of the income and let's say the particular portion of the house you're renting out is one-fifth of the overall um, square meterage of the house then if you've got any costs that are associated with that you can claim them maybe one-fifth of the electricity one-fifth of the water costs so one-fifth of the expenses on the property one-fifth of the rates you can claim all of those things what you have to understand though is once you start doing that then you also have to 
allow for capital gains. Your principal place of residence is capital gains tax free, but if you rent out part of the house, that's going to impact on that. So when you finally sell, do you want to have to work out what your gain was, apportion it for the period that you rented it out and apportion it again for that one fifth or whatever the case may be, because that's the amount of the gain that you will then pay tax on. You'll get to halve it if it's more than 12 months and it'll be your marginal rate of tax. So it might only be a small amount anyway, but someone should do those figures for you before you go in and do it. There are some other ways around this as well, and I've seen people who rather than rent out part of their house, what they actually do is they allow someone they know to come and have the use of part of their house in return for that person just helping out with household expenses. So it might be that in return for you giving someone a room and maybe a lounge room in your house, you get them to pay part of your electricity and maybe part of your water costs, and you don't actually take any rent from them. They could buy groceries for you and help you with your household expenses and then you're not renting out the property and you're not accruing that capital gains tax. You need some really good advice from your accountant before you do anything because this is one of those things where you can't close the gate after the horse has bolted. Thanks so much for all of the great questions so far. We're going to be around for a while, so it's not too late to ask us any question that you might have. It could be about the property market in general or a specific question about your personal requirements. For now, though, it's time to take a short break, but we'll be back soon. If you have a question for anyone on the panel this evening, remember the question of the week will receive a copy of my book, How to Create an Income for Life. So call us on 1300 30 34 35 or email us at property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back. If you've just tuned in, you're watching the property edition of Your Money, Your Call, and we're answering all of your property investing questions. Tonight, you'll be speaking with Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors and Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. And of course, I can also answer any property investing questions that you might have. So call us on 1300 30 34 35, or you can email us on property at skynews.com.au. And both from the Gold Coast, I believe you're a first time investor. Uh, yes, that's correct. Welcome to the program. What can we do for you? Um, well, I have a few investments like with shares, and I'm looking at going into a sort of business as well. Mm -hmm. But I'm I'm only 22 as well, so still quite new to this Excellent. all. Excellent. But I'm I'm currently li living on the Gold Coast, and I was just wondering where in Queensland should I? look for a long-term investment mm. in the property. Uh, now, but before we answer that question, I will ask you a question. Why does it have to be in Queensland just because you live there? Yeah, well, I guess more because it's my sort of first time. I'm um, somewhere a little bit more familiar and that sort of thing. Ah, now, I'm going to talk to you about that in a moment. But meanwhile, Andrew, most likely not the Gold Coast. Most likely not the Gold Coast, but we would say that the Gold Coast is probably bottoming out or getting to the bottom of its yeah. price cycle. In the suburbs, though, yeah. rather than those. Yeah. Perhaps, you know, the perhaps investment's not the right uh, type of an opportunity there. Similar to the Sunshine Coast, which is also uh, getting to the bottom, we hope, of its price cycle. Um, tends to be a little speculative, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, I still believe that uh, investment, good investments are to be had in Brisbane. Uh, circumstances sort of got together last year with the floods and various issues that uh, kept that uh, prices soft in, in Brisbane through most of the year and I think we're starting to see a build up there so if you could perhaps locate a good property somewhere in the Brisbane suburban, suburban area I think that yeah. might be a good opportunity. And probably those southern suburbs yes. with that corridor all the way yes. out to Ipswich, uh, through Logan. Red Bank, yep. they're all the real, yep. you know they're the mortgage belt but they certainly are the area where we're mm. getting a concentration of demand at the yes, moment I think. Absolutely. Um, and a lot of that was flood proof. A lot yeah. of that didn't suffer at all from the floods, mm. which I think also gave it a real boost along. Ben. Uh, G'day, Bo. Uh, thanks for the call. Listen, um, I understand what you're doing in terms of you wanting to touch it and feel it. You're the first time it's in your market, in that market that you live in, in your own state. Margaret's going to talk about your mindset later on. What I want to talk about is, is obviously a couple of areas that I think in Brisbane might be worth a look, and they are Cooparoo and Bulimba. There are two areas of, of the Brisbane market which are within five or ten kilometres and I actually like entry level properties in those type of markets for you because you've got obviously a well 
um, grounded base of employment opportunities. You've got an established market there, again, outside the flood zones. So I would be looking at those type of areas if, you, if you're steadfast on, on staying in the Queensland market. They're going to be predictable over the medium to longer term. And Margaret's now going to talk to you about some of the other opportunities in other states. Yeah, look, Bo, what I want to tell you is this. Just because you live in an area doesn't mean you know it from an investment perspective. And I've had a conversation with many people who buy on their own back doorstep. And when I ask them why, they tell me that it's because they know the area. But when we go on to talk about what it is that they actually do know about the area, it's never anything to do with its investment potential. They never know what the, the rate of population growth is. They never know what the vacancy rate is at the present time on both units and houses. They never know what kind of property the demographics demand. They never know whether the median house household income is actually growing over census periods because that indicates a, a, a population that's becoming more affluent and giving them the money to put back into property so property continues to grow. These are the kinds of things that you only know when you ask the questions as an investor. And as an investor you can ask those questions of any area, it doesn't have to be one close by where you live. A further complication can be that when you do buy close to where you live, you fall into the trap of needing to go and have a look. And when you have a look, then it all becomes about the emotional buy more than it does about whether or not it's a good sense buy. And I've found that you know a lot of the properties that I own, if I had have seen them before I bought them, I never would have bought them in the first place. And many of them have been amazing investments in other states that have doubled and tripled in value since I bought them. And as I said, I wouldn't have bought them if I'd looked at them. So despite what they looked like, they still performed well because the investment fundamentals existed. That's the most important thing for you as a first time investor. Become educated before you jump in. Make sure that you don't just take advice from a TV show and that you actually become educated with bona fide information yourself and you have the power then to not be taken advantage of by people who are trying to sell you the wrong thing. Knowledge is always power and no more important than investing. Uh, you go out there and get as educated as you can and then go back and have a think about where it is that, you, that might be the best place for you to buy rather than the one that feels the most comfortable for you. Jim from Early Beach. Welcome to the program. How is it up in Ely at the moment? Uh, very good, thank you, Margaret. So there's a proposal to make a change to the, um, the way traffic's flowing around Ely Beach at the present time, Jim. Is there? I live out of town. I, I don't really keep up with these things. So. Yeah, there is. They're going to make it go up Beagley Street and around the back, and it's all quite crazy. But anyway, you've got a question about Wyala. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've, um, this is our fourth investment. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been tossing up between Wyala, Wagga and Dubbo and uh, Wyala seems to be coming out on top. Okay. Um, my investments have sort of been long term and fairly stable, however this time I'm looking at trying to take advantage of the, um, the mining boom or the potential mining boom in South Australia. Um, and that's particularly why I'm looking at Wyala. Yes. Um, what I've sort of narrowed down to, there are quite a few duplexes for sale that are quite cheap, around 200, 220,000 mark. Um, in addition, there's some other properties around 300,000, three bedroom, two bathroom. Now I'm basically stuck between making a decision over which two I want to buy. Okay. All right. Well, look, um, Andrew, you were very quiet through the debate that um, Ben and I were having off air about Wyala, and you didn't really put your two cents worth in as to what you think about uh, the area. Well, well certainly regional centres uh, will benefit from uh, significant uh, local economic activity and in this case of course we're talking about the, the mining activity that's, uh, that will become on stream in that region. Um, so I guess fundamentals do point to perhaps um, some quite reasonable outcomes uh, in the medium term for Wyala mm. but I guess there's still a few question marks there and uh, mm. I think that's what you're alluding to. Margaret. Yeah I agree. I know Ben I think what we're going to be seeing happening is that we've seen people get into those mining towns like Caratha and Derby you were talking about it earlier and Port Hedland prior to their booms there and they've, they've they've experienced really obscene gains in their property values. Some of them have gone up you know, five times their initial value. They're get, getting great cash flows. And there are a lot of people out there who really want to emulate that now. And I'm worried that many of them are going to throw caution to the wind and not 
actually consider what we're talking about here in terms of risk. There's no question in my mind that you can make a significant amount of money from a mining town, but I think your timing has to be impeccable both in and out, and I think that there is a, a, a much larger element of risk in investing in a mining town. There, no doubt there is, Margaret. And, and Jim, what I'm pleased about is being the fourth property that you own, it's actually good that you're sort of looking at it and because it is it's high risk, high reward. So that's what we're talking about here. So as long as it doesn't undo the buy and hold or the long term strategy that you've put in place. In, in coming back to the question around if you are going Wyala, I understand that. We don't know the asset here, so we're only giving you some guidance. What I like about the lower end property valuations as opposed to buying the higher end property is that the volatility is lower at that end. I mean, even if you had some people who are on government welfare in that area, the, the, the probability of a property value is going down lower than what your government handouts may be is obviously lower. So you're minimising risk at that lower entry level. And so I want you to do a bit of research around the demand for that type of accommodation. If the demand is well and truly higher for the three bedroom at the higher end, then that's worth considering. But otherwise, if it's just about a head on a bed and I'm just come here to do my work so I can earn my money and I can move on, then that might be the option for you. Mm. Look, there's no question in my mind, Jim, as I said, that mining towns can do very well and have done incredibly well. But one of the only things that worries me about them is what I call hidden risk. Now, hidden risk is the risk that you cannot see coming. You can't anticipate its arrival. I'll give you a good example of that, and it didn't end up having that big an impact yet, but let's say a mining tax. We might have a burgeoning industry, it might be rocketing along and it could be creating great property values in the area and suddenly the government makes a decision to, to have some kind of an impost that then results in the, the entire industry falling over or you know the big mining companies fleeing Australia and going to Canada where there's plenty of resources as well. Now under those circumstances then you're left holding the baby and you will have a property that suddenly plummets in value and you can't get a tenant either and then you can't sell it so you've got the triple whammy going on there. I, I just urge you to think about those things. Your timing has to be impeccable both in and out which means that you have to say to yourself this is how much money I'd like to make from that and when I make it I'll get out even if it looks like it's still increasing. I like the fact that you are looking in that lower end as Ben says to me there's a lot more comfort. That means that the extent of your loss if it does indeed lose is around about the 200 odd thousand mark and being your fifth property that is a loss that you may be able to sustain. Always go in these things thinking if I lose could I handle it? Under those circumstances then the worst case scenario you'll manage and when it doesn't eventuate then it's going to be a great return for you. Wyala, I'm not so sure yet. I think it's a little premature for Wyala. But at 220000 it's certainly worth the risk on your part. And you can probably sit on it for a little while and wait until the, the, the goods come along in the end. Well, thanks for all of your questions so far. It's time again for another short break, but we'll be back. And if you'd like to call up and ask us any question about property, call now on 1330 3435. Or you can also email us on property at skynews.com.au. Welcome back to Your Money, Your Call. I'm Margaret Lomas and helping me to answer your questions tonight is Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors and Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. Now there's a little bit of time left for you to call and ask any question about property investing. The number is 1300 30 34 35. You can email us on property at skynews.com.au. Jerry from Melbourne, you've got a question about Brighton. How are you? Thank you for taking me call. You're um, welcome. Yeah, just uh, 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 Quick question um, uh, regarding Brighton. Uh -huh. I've just purchased a property there, and I'm just sort of half-hearted about whether I should go units or single single dwelling on the property. Okay. Being up in the market. So you've and got an opportunity two, to. Two, the costs of building are still up there, whereas a lot of people are saying that the sort of up in the market prices have sort of windled, swelled down a bit. Mm -hmm. So that's the question of the panel, please. So Jerry, it's a block of land then that you've bought, yeah. and it's got the potential to take a unit development. That's Correct. Okay. Um, I'm not sure about units in Brighton. I'm not sure about the demand for units in Brighton because at the moment it's very, very house and land. Um, but I could be wrong. Well, Brighton still has a substantial or a significant 
unit uh, market. Brighton's very interesting. Uh, it's actually fallen away quite significantly amongst those prestige suburbs in Melbourne over the last 18 months. I think Brighton's very good buying at the moment, to be okay. quite honest. I think there's a lot of upside to Brighton. Uh, it has a, a significant cachet in terms of uh, prestige buyers, uh, and that always attracts uh, a capital gain over the medium term. And I think Brighton, to a certain degree, has been oversold, and I think buyers are starting to realise that at the moment too. So would you do a unit or a house on that block? Uh, so it's hard to determine, really. I think if it was a quality unit, larger unit, a couple of larger units, that uh, I think the market could hold that. Mm. I mean, Australians are building smaller houses now. They're moving into away from the quarter acre dream uh, and into smaller type of residences, open planned living. So, um, you know, a larger unit or a couple of larger units might be uh, quite a viable opportunity, particularly in Brighton. Mm. Ben? Yeah, Brighton's a, a classic Melbourne market. Tree Line Street's uh, very much a sort of owner-occupied area. Um, the question, Jerry, really comes down to what type of expectations do you have on your return? Are you planning to buy, build and hold? Are you planning to develop and sell? Are you planning to develop and sell down? I mean, depending on your finances and your cash flows, the advice I would give would be around those types of, of outcomes that you're trying to do. If you're in a position where you can hold on to it, um, obviously the rule of thumb with development is usually one into three goes best. If you can get three onto the site, that's great, but you've got to be able to cash flow it. It's certainly higher risk and you're not an investor, then you're a developer. So you've got, to, you've got to make sure that you're also factoring in your time if you're going to be managing that project, as opposed to you know, a turnkey solution or an armchair solution, which is get in a builder, fixed price contract and build something, and then look for a quick gain. Um, but they're going to come down to the numbers and the research that you do. Um, so ultimately it is about what type of outcome you're looking for. Are you looking for a cash flow outcome, something that you sit on, or is it something you're looking for for a quick profit turnover and to replicate down the track? Mm. They're the questions I'll be asking. And of course, if you are going to be selling any of them when you do build them, you're not going to be getting the capital gains tax discount if you sell them within 12 months. So there's a lot of issues here. I think, Jerry, that it has to come down to a financial exercise. And whatever you work out to be the answer, then add 20% to it because budgets always blow out. I don't think I've ever seen anybody ever come to me and say, Margaret, I did a development and it came in significantly under what I thought it was going to cost me and therefore I've made a heap of money. Because we'll probably get a whole pile of calls now from people who have done exactly that and I'd love to hear from them. But generally speaking, because of the time period involved, the difficulty in establishing before you start a build what things are going to cost you in nine months or 12 months time when you're starting to put them in the house, we do often see blowouts happen. So cost it out very well and see how you go with that. Some of our viewers write and ask me about developing a property just like um, we had a question, a caller then. And Tina also wrote and she said, I have seven properties and usually utilise the buy and hold strategy. One of those properties is a small older house on a block of nearly 900 square metres. I bought it four years ago for 195000 and it's now valued at approximately 265000 It's currently receiving $250 a week rent and my issue is this property is starting to become higher in maintenance due to its age around the 1960s. My question is, should I change my strategy slightly, knock the property down and build two modern properties or sell it and put the profits into another property investment? Difficult because we can't give financial advice here, but you know, there's probably something to be said if it is starting to get older for maybe developing it. Andrew. Absolutely. Well, it, it, it on surface looks like a good proposition. Uh, certainly uh, the maintenance costs are going to increase and if it's a, a good area that will hold a unit uh, development then uh, it, it sounds like once the homework's done, feasibilities are done, that it could be uh, quite a viable option. Mm. Ben? Yeah, we don't know the location but 900 square metres, that's usually a three slash four unit block development. Mm. Um, four units usually commercial lending, three units you can still get at resi lending. We don't know what Tina's income circumstances are like but again be mindful, you're not an investor then, you're, you're basically a developer, make sure as Margaret's saying, you're factoring in the inexperience, the 20% overruns, all those types of things, your time to do the project. They're the sort of things I'll be thinking about. Mm, yeah. And look, if you think you can bite this one off, Tina, it's probably not a bad idea. Some things to consider before you race ahead and do it. If you are going to, to pull down an existing property, before you do it, get uh, one of the, the quantity surveying companies in to have a look at that property and do a depreciation report. That's because everything that you throw out, you can put down as scrapping in the year that you throw it out, which can make you significant gains in terms of tax breaks there. Um, and it's a great idea to try and get those straight up. Then you can build the new property 
get them back in again, have some more depreciation reports done so that you get all that the benefits of the new property as well. Again, it comes down to what the costs come out to be. Work it out, get someone to cost it for you and work out whether it's more than you can chew or whether it's exactly right for you. Costa from Brisbane, you've got a question about the Gold Coast. Oh uh, yes, hello. Um, yeah, so I've got an uh, investment property in the Gold Coast. Yes. And um, yeah, it's negative gearing pretty badly. I've had it for probably about yeah, five years now. Okay. And uh, yeah, just just trying to work out whether to sell it or hold on to it because at the moment the um, and the market's pretty bad. Okay, Costa, great, Andrew. Well, as we mentioned before, Margaret, I think that um, the Gold Coast is certainly getting to the bottom of its current uh, price trough. I think uh, it's a medium-term prospect at the moment rather than a short-term prospect. So it's just a question really of um, how long you're prepared to hold and your capacity to hold over the medium term if you want to start seeing some capital gains come through. And sometimes, Ben, a time comes, particularly if you're highly negatively geared, where you've got to cut your losses and get out, yeah. Yeah, this might be one of those occasions. I, I, we don't know. If you're in a high-rise block, if there's oversupply in the area that you're in, these are the considerations that says what is going to drive the capital growth in those areas. The income is stagnant in that marketplace. The job opportunities are relatively stagnant in that marketplace. The Gold Coast Council are doing everything to try and secure some fly-in, fly-out mining work, which is going to hopefully bring in some income into that area. They're trying everything because they obviously know that, uh, that they have a, a struggling property market and uh, you know, the Gold Coast was built on, on basically the property market. So pretty much from my point of view, they're going to come down to the numbers cost to get some independent advice, um, someone who has no bias towards what it is you're trying to achieve and uh, you should be able to make an informed decision based on the opportunity that may present itself if you do turn the property over. Mm, sounds like good advice. Um, fly in, fly out workers for the Gold Coast? I don't know. I mean, you don't go to the Gold Coast so you can fly in and fly out and go mining. No, no, they're <laughs> flying from into the mines and yeah, coming no, that's back what I'm to saying, the Gold but you Coast. Don't, you don't go and live on the Gold Coast so that you can fly out of there to go mining. You live on the Gold Coast for a lifestyle change, I think. Look, Costa, I would have a look at exactly where that property is situated. Parts of the Gold Coast, as in the outer suburban parts, will, will probably recover first, I would suggest, on the Gold Coast. Coast. A lot of those are still quite affordable if you get up toward Cooma and then a little bit further north again and around Mount Warren Park which is now just on the border of the Gold Coast, used to be part of Brisbane, it's been taken in by the Gold Coast. You've got some affordable markets there and they'll recover first. If your property is in one of those then it might be worth hanging on to but only if it isn't crippling you financially. If you've got a unit on the Gold Coast where the supply just keeps coming and coming and coming then it could be a good time to cut your losses and get out. Don't do anything without talking to a professional, particularly your accountant, who can tell you the bottom line of every strategy. Well, we've already run out of time, but don't worry, I'll be back again next week. And joining me will be Sam Ailiff and Michael Tees. Now, our question of the week this week came from making an independent decision here because we haven't had a chance to talk about it. But I thought, Bo, you live on the Gold Coast. You're about to undertake your first property investing and How to Create an Income for Life is just a perfect book for you. I'd love you to have a read of that. So what you need to do now is to email me at yourmoneyyourcall at destiny.com.au. Your money, your call at destiny.com.au and I will send you a copy of the book. Thank you to our guests Andrew Wilson from Australian Property Monitors and Ben Kingsley from Empower Wealth. Of course you'll agree that they did an awesome job tonight and of course I'm going to have them back again very soon. You can follow me on Twitter, Margaret Lomas AU, and if you need some guidance on your property journey, go to my website, destiny.com.au. Now, while you're there, you can also sign up for my newsletter and get a little bit of up-to-date property information every single month. Of course, I'll see you again this Saturday here on 602 for Property Success. We're showing some great Season 3 highlights, and I'll be back again on the 5th of May with our all-new all new look show which is now season four thanks for being with us have a great week the information featured in this program is general in nature and therefore should not be relied upon guests appearing on the program may have commercial arrangements with some of the companies mentioned before making any investment insurance or financial planning decisions you should consult a licensed professional who can advise whether your decision is appropriate for you